Okay, sorry, I was having some technical difficulties and I've had to start a new video instead of continuing with the previous video. So, so hopefully you guys have stopped the video or just ended that video and have a thought, try to figure out some of the key differences between this model in chapter 12 and what we've seen in 11. But let me talk about it anyways. Okay. So first of all, at steady state, uh, let me know that steady state, we are going to have this much capital for effective worker, and this much output for work. What we also know is that At the steady state, uh, growth of technology and population are GA and GN. So think about this, okay? In the previous chapter, once we reached the steady state, let me go back to that actually. This is what we have seen in chapter 11. Once we got to the steady state here, uh, once we got here, the economy quite literally stopped. It did not stop producing and you know, working and everything. It stopped growing. Uh, if pop, uh, population was, let's say, 100, uh, each person had one unit of capital to work with and let's say output per worker was two so economy as a whole had uh, 100 units of capital and 200 units of output the economy literally stopped there it stopped as in it stopped to join so it continued to produce 100 units of output uh, sorry 200 units of output and to produce this, it needed capital. And of course, there was depreciation. As a result, the 100 unit of capital that was needed had to be co continuously replenished. So suppose depreciation was 10%. So every year, there was depreciation of 10% of 100. So 10 units of capital was getting worn out. So investment had to be 10 to replenish that so that at the beginning of every year we have 100 units of capital and by using this we were going to produce 200 units of output. This was happening every single year so the economy had not stopped per se but what was happening is that there was no more growth and standard of living had stagnated at whatever level we were. But of course that was because over here there is no growth in population, there is no growth in uh, technology. So if we come back to what we have here, and we have importantly, these two things. As a result, what this means is that, and of course GA and GN are, notice, are in the denominators of the steady state capital and output. What that means is that, let me write it down and then I'll explain. To maintain the steady state level of output and capital, what would we need to do? Uh, what would have to happen is that uh, output and capital will 
have to grow at GA plus GA. Okay, so let me explain. It should be pretty obvious for some of you already. As we saw in chapter 11, once we reach the steady state, everything stopped. If a person is, if a worker is producing X units, he would continue to produce X units and there would be no change in that. If a worker had X units of capital to work with, he would continue to have X units of capital to work with and that would not change. In this chapter, let's, I mean, we have technology and population. Let's focus on just one. Let's think of just uh, population. Population is growing. As a result, if we want to maintain a steady state level of output per worker, remember, these are per worker or per effective worker terms. So if each effective worker is used to consuming five units of output, and now the population is growing, and we want to keep giving five units of output to each worker, what would we have to do? We would have to produce more. Produce more, we would also need more capital. And so that's what we mean that to maintain the steady state level of output and capital, just to maintain where we are, what would have to happen is that output and capital would have to grow. So my example was with just in terms of population, but the same applies for technology as well. As technology is improving, of course, remember how we have defined technology. As technology is improving with the same level of inputs, we get more output. So we will have more output and we will also have more capital, which allows us to produce more output. So the good thing, Uh, so the good thing or the more realistic thing about the model in this chapter is that there is no stagnation. Output and capital continues to increase. And of course you guys will know that that's a much more realistic scenario. Growth may be very small, growth may be just 1%, 2%. In Bangladesh, we are used to having 7 8% growth. There is always growth. GDP is always increasing, right? So we, we sort of have explained that by introducing technology and population growth in this model. Uh, so, there are a lot of other implications that you guys can find from this and this. Uh, for example, I'm just going to point out one implication and hopefully you guys will read the book and figure out the other implications. So the question is, uh, at steady state, what happens to output per worker? Let's say output per effective worker. What will happen to this? So first thing you need to know is that, of course, uh, from here you guys know that AN grows at GA plus GN. But what you also know is that workers at GN. So therefore, at steady state, output per worker is, or we can just write Y, grows at GA. Now think about even if the mechanics isn't clear to you guys, and you don't understand how we derive this, think about it practically. You have a worker who's working with the same uh, same capital that he had, but what has happened now 
is that technology has grown. As technology grows, he can produce more output. And so what you're seeing is that work output per worker is increasing. How much we get from each worker is increasing. And, and this is also a much more realistic scenario. If you guys think of how much output we used to get from a worker 20 years ago, and how much output we get from workers today, you'll see that today workers are much more effective. And the answer is that's because of technology. Okay. So this is just one implication. There are plenty more implications. Uh, so that's it for chapter uh, 12. Let me summarize very quickly what, what we've done. So first thing we did is we relaxed the assumption that population and technology are fixed. We allowed them to move and uh, we allowed them to change. And that was, where did I write that down? This were their growth rates. Population increased at GN, growth of N, and technology growth as at GN, growth of N. What we also did, because we introduced technology into the model, is instead of looking at uh, per worker, we started looking at effective worker, per effective worker terms. Uh, and using that, we derived this. And then every, uh, so, and then over here, we had to modify the steady state equation because now we no longer have to worry about depreciation. We also have to worry about uh, rising population and technology and all that. So we got a new steady state equation. Using that, we drew this diagram. And then we sort of analyzed them. And what we saw was that this model, once we've endogenized uh, growth of population and growth of technology, allowed for growth. So what we had talked about in the previous chapter is where does growth come from? And we saw that capital accumulation, which usually comes from savings, would not lead to long run growth, only in the short run. And then we said technology progress would probably be the way to go about that. So well, we've done that now. We've included technology. And now what we see is that technology, progress in technology is going to give us constant growth. Even at the steady state, uh, which is here. So let me just draw the arrows. We are always going to converge at the steady state, okay? which is this point. But even at this point, once we have technology and population in the model, we are no longer stagnating. Output no longer stops, but it continues to grow. Capital continues to grow and countries continue to get bigger and bigger as we see all around us. So this is technically the end of our long run analysis. Okay, this is it. What we are going to do in the final chapter, in chapter 13 is we are going to take short run analysis and long medium run analysis. We have already combined them to find the LMPC model. Chapter 13, we're going to add all of this together. So finally, everything is coming together. Now. Uh, when we did chapter three, chapter four, things may not have made sense to you guys. You didn't really see where we were going with all this disparate information, but now we're slowly starting to put them together. At the end of chapter 13, you guys will have a complete holistic picture about how the economy works. In the short run, few days, few weeks, few months, few years, and in the long run, in a 10 year period, in a 20, 50, 50 year period, how does an economy perform? So that's what we will do in chapter 13. Uh, we are 
I'm going to solve a problem next, of course, from the book, but there will be no assignments from this chapter. We'll leave that for chapter 13, all right?